It's August 1992. In a villa in Brno, talks about the future of Czechoslovakia are taking place. The most important part happens in this garden. The leaders of the Czech Republic and Slovakia leave the negotiations and in these rustic surroundings agree on the details of the split, which happens a few months later. How did this happen? Do the Czechs and Slovaks regret that they are no longer one country? To find out, we spoke to experts and people who witnessed this history from both the Czech Republic and Slovakia. This photo shows residents of Philadelphia in 1918. They are probably among the first to see a map of Europe with the word Czechoslovakia on it. It was only then, towards the end of the First World War, that this country came into being. Before that, no one had heard of Czechoslovakia. So where did the idea of a joint state for Czechs and Slovaks come from? Well, when Austria-Hungary broke up, the Czechs and Slovaks were afraid of their stronger neighbors. The Czechs feared the Germans, and the Slovaks feared the Hungarians. Therefore, they decided that they would be good allies, and that a joint Czechoslovak state would be bigger, and therefore stronger. You could say that it really was a marriage of convenience, and in fact you can see that these two nations were also safeguarding themselves against possible future attempts by either Budapest or Vienna to recreate a monarchy. But why did Czechs ally themselves with Slovaks? This is what we asked the prominent Czech historian, Professor Jan Rychlik. In the 19th century, there was already a sense that we were simply actually one nation. But this is only how Czechs see it, not Slovaks. That's how a minority saw us, but that's how the Slovaks also looked at the Czechs, that we were close and that probably of all the neighbors, the Czech direction was the most useful one. So that's the Czechoslovakism factor, as it was later called, that Czechs and Slovaks didn't look at the fact that they spoke similar but different languages, but that they are in fact one nation, at least in this political sense. For the Slovaks, or for the Slovak elite of the time, the creation of a common state with the Czechs was an opportunity for independence from the Hungarians, with whom they had lived together for hundreds of years. And on the part of the Czechs, there was really no threat of any significant cultural assimilation. It's a similar language. Culturally, Czechs are very close to Slovaks. So in this sense, it was a much more optimal choice from the perspective of the Slovak elites than for a joint state with Hungary. However, the creation of Czechoslovakia was, for many, much more than a pressing need. Some representatives of the elite believed that this was a way to create a new nation. One such person was Thomas Masaryk. Masaryk was the first president of Czechoslovakia and is also sometimes referred to as the father of independence. Masaryk's faith in Czechoslovakia may be justified by his background. He was born here in Hodonin in Moravia, the border between the Czech Republic and Slovakia. When a man from Hodonin looks on one side and then the other, to tell you the truth, these populations did not only seem the same, did not only approach everything in the same way, but above all, they even speak the same language, because it is no longer Czech and it is not yet Slovak. That was how Masaryk was brought up, so to speak, and that shouldn't be a surprise. He thought we spoke two languages, but that was not important. What was important is that we understand each other, and from that a political nation can emerge, as it did in Switzerland, for example, or in the United States. I think the United States inspired him a lot. As you may know, he had an American wife, Charlotte Garrigue. 
The idea of Czechoslovakism arose pragmatically because there were simply more Germans than Slovaks in the new state in the 18th century. And it is difficult to create a Czechoslovakia if there are even fewer Slovaks than Germans. The idea was therefore pragmatic. It would mean there were many more Czechs and Slovaks compared to Hungarians and to Germans. It was a manufactured idea. Although the idea of Czechoslovakism assumed equality between the two nations, it was only superficial. As much as 90% of Czechoslovak national income came from the Czechs, only 9% was from Slovakia. Slovak sociologist Michał Vašečka explains why this was the case. In a way, this was also a concept that showed a certain Czech dominance in the country. Slovaks are reluctant to talk about it, of course, but as Czechoslovakia came into being, we need to remember that 52% of all industry in the whole Habsburg monarchy was in Czech territories. It was the engine of the entire monarchy. On the other side was little Slovakia, which was practically without any industry. It was an agrarian state and quite a lot of people were uneducated. Connecting these two parts of Central Europe was very problematic and the Czechs in a very natural way viewed this eastern population as one that is simply not completely compatible with them. The purpose of Czechoslovakism was to create a new nation. Typically, it's nations that create states, but in this case, the state was intended to create a nation. As we know today, there has never been a case where two already mature nations with their own identities would merge into a new political nation. The First Republic was a relatively stable democratic state. But contrary to its name, Czechoslovakia, it was not the Slovaks who were the second largest nation in the country. It was the Germans who outnumbered the Slovaks. From the beginning of the Republic, separatist movements by Sudeten Germans were feared. And this fear was exploited by Adolf Hitler. On September 30th, 1938, the Munich Agreement was signed the one that, according to the then British Prime Minister, would bring peace for our time. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. However, this only led to the Sudetenland being granted to Germany, and this was only the beginning of the partition of Czechoslovakia. Poland occupied trans olza Silesia, and Hungary occupied southern Slovakia and the Transcarpathian Ruthenia. The first Czechoslovak Republic collapsed. In its place, a second Czechoslovak Republic came into being, this time spelled with a hyphen, and we'll explain why this is important later in the film. However, even this state did not survive. For Hitler, this weakening of Czechoslovakia was still not enough. He threatened Slovaks that if they did not secede from the Czechs, their country would be absorbed into Hungary. As a result, the Slovak parliament declared independence on March 14, 1939. Thus, for the first time in history, a Slovak Republic was established and the second Czechoslovak Republic ceased to exist. Wtedy już Slovacy nic robić nie mogli. In 1939, there was nothing more the Slovaks could do. It was clear that the rest of the Czech lands would be absorbed into Germany. What were they supposed to do? Have some sort of pseudo-sympathy or solidarity, or be absorbed into Germany? Germany had a vested interest at the time in having Slovakia as an independent state. It was a German intrigue. Tiso claimed that if he didn't secede, then the Hungarians would absorb them. Hungary would not be able to do that without the permission of Germany. The Slovaks were de facto forced into independence. Of course, the Slovak Republic was a puppet state, implementing the policies of the Third Reich. It was headed by a priest, Father Josef Tiso. The Second World War made it clear, with the Czech Republic as a protectorate of the Reich and Slovakia an independent state, independent in inverted commas, dependent on the German Reich, but with all the characteristics of an independent state. There was no Gestapo there, apart from this so-called Schultz zone, 
the German zone of protection in the West, there were no German troops. The existence of this Slovak state, the first Slovak Republic, influenced the Slovak people to understand that they did not need the Czechs, that they could live in their own state too. That was not obvious in the 1920s and 30s. There were various discussions about this. Could Slovakia theoretically exist as an independent state? The Second World War showed that it could. After World War II, an independent Slovakia was not established. Czechoslovakia was. An independent Slovakia was not created as it was associated with the Nazis and Slovaks themselves were also eager to join Czechs. They became allies and at the same time, winners of the war. Czechoslovakia was established, but without Carpathian Ruthenia, which was annexed by the USSR. Today, these territories are part of Ukraine. This is how, in 1945, the next 45 years of communist Czechoslovakia were established. Czechs and Slovaks lived relatively peacefully together throughout the history of the communist Czechoslovakia. Tensions between the two nations were virtually non-existent, but on the other hand, creating a common identity was not easy. The problem was a lack of common history. Slovakia Slovakia has never belonged to the Czech state, so to speak, and this state has existed for more than 1,000 years. For Slovaks, Czech kings are no less foreign than the kings of any other state, like Charles IV, who is considered the most eminent Czech king. To Slovaks, he is as foreign as Louis XIV or Charlemagne or any other king. There were attempts to resolve this. We had a textbook in secondary schools, Czechoslovak history, but Czechoslovak history begins on the 28th of October 1918. Before that, there is no history of Czechoslovakia. There is the history of the Czech Republic and the history of Slovakia, which is part of the political history of Hungary. So it was done that there was always a parallel section, one for the history of the Czech Republic and one for the history of Slovakia, which is actually the history of Hungary, at least until the beginning of the 19th century. There were also elements that united the nation. One of these was sports. Moments such as third place in the 1962 Football World Cup and the European Championship in 1976 built a sense of community. Well, of course, athletes are important. It can be said that there is a certain common cultural heritage, especially a kind of popular mass culture, which spreads through television. For example, Czechoslovak pop music, which was really shared by Czechs and Slovaks, regardless of the language of these songs. Another element was cinematography. This belongs to this shared heritage. However, these elements were not enough to build a common identity. I think that at that time there were not a lot of people who could consider themselves to be Czechoslovak. Although there were some differences and interesting, I would even say linguistic differences. Czech people. They usually said that they, they come from Czechoslovakia. They said, we Czech, we Czech people, but we're from Czechoslovakia. And that was the difference at the time, because also a lot of people, uh, in, I mean, in Slovakia, a lot of people say primarily we're from Slovakia, we're, we're Slovak. And that's also something you could feel. The identification among the Slovak population with the concept of Czechoslovakia at the time, even, I mean, with the term Czechoslovakia, was shaky, much more shakier than in here in the Czech part of the Federation. I have a Polish railway guide at home that I bought in some antique shop in Warsaw on Krakowskia Przedmieścia Street. The guide has the region of Zakopane and it says that at the police station you can get a pass to the Czech side of the Tatra Mountains for five zloty. If a Slovak reads this, they'd fall off their chair. There is no such thing as the Czech side of the Tatra Mountains, but that is always the case. If tomorrow you go to Barcelona, perhaps at home you might say that you are going to Spain, although this is not true. Barcelona is, after all, Catalonia or try to say, I really like it here in England while in Edinburgh. 
The idea of a multinational state is seen from the outside as the state of this predominantly strongest nation. The Soviet Union was also seen as Russia. This asymmetry created tensions, but these were suppressed by the communist authorities. The situation changed when the Soviet bloc collapsed. At the end of 1989, the Velvet Revolution broke out in Czechoslovakia, which led to the overthrow of the communists. The divisions between Czechs and Slovaks quickly became apparent. The so-called hyphen war began. It was about the name of the state itself, or rather the way it would be spelled. Should the Czechoslovak Federative Republic be written with or without a hyphen? The Slovaks demanded the hyphen be used. According to them, this emphasized the balance of the two nations in a common state. In the end, yet another name was chosen. The Czech and Slovak Federative Republic. This was just one symptom that among Slovaks there was a sense of separateness. To talk about this, we meet with Franciszek Mikloszko, who was a speaker of the Slovak National Council in the early 1990s, still in Czechoslovakia. He recalls that after the fall of communism, his friends with whom he fought the communists came to power, both Czechs and Slovaks. Once communism had finally collapsed, I could not imagine a conflict arising between friends. They had persecuted us together, they locked us up together, but there was one thing that hadn't crossed my mind, that this national principle would take off straight away. The Slovak national principle. I see two reasons for this phenomenon. On the one hand, this Slovak problem was still somewhere in the subconscious. Nation states are a characteristic of Central Europe, and a nation achieves fulfillment when it has its own state and can govern it independently. This was the case, although under communism you didn't feel it, because everyone was kind of in seclusion and kept quiet. And back in January, the nationalists immediately took off and it was enough of Prague, let's govern ourselves, etc. Also, there was one very interesting thing going on. In November 1989, we were the ones in the stands. We were the ones who dealt the cards afterwards. We were in power. We were the ones who decided who was going to be a minister of what and so on. We, meaning the Society Against Violence movement. And those communists waited to see how it would develop. They were quiet. When it turned out that communism was collapsing, they realized that they were on the sidelines and immediately chose the national note. Intense discussions began about the future of Czechoslovakia. The country's most important politician, President Václav Havel, wanted to preserve the Union. On one occasion, Havel called me and Jan Czarnogórski as Prime Minister of the Slovak government in Czechoslovakia to the Prague Castle. We sat down in a small historic room. He says to us, Listen, if Slovakia wants to separate, I'm the last person who will stand in the way. But remember that these fathers of ours didn't create this Czechoslovak Republic in 1918 by accident. Simply put, it protects you against the Hungarians and us against the Germans. It is a certain larger entity, which no one will easily get at. He was a supporter of Czechoslovakia. Václav Klaus was also a supporter of a common state. Just before the 1992 elections, Klaus, me and some others were invited to a TV program called Soti den Dal. After the program, Klaus told me, Mr. Speaker, we can't go on like this, meeting in castles and palaces, making alliances, establishing competences. The leaders of the winning parties have to meet, agree on the shape of the state, and I have to bring this will to my political parties. And we must close this quickly. We cannot drag it out. And indeed, that was what happened. The 1992 elections were decisive. The Czech part of the federation was headed by Václav Klaus. According to him, Czechoslovakia was to be a federation, albeit a strongly centralized one. But even more important was the Slovak part of this election. Although the Slovaks did not support the Slovak National Party, which explicitly called for independence, they did support Vladimir Mečar. According to his vision, Czechoslovakia was to be a confederation. You could feel that there was that, that an ideal was impossible, and the reason why any deal was impossible at that time, it was that just there's no common idea, common platform anymore. 
The majority of Czech political representation or Czech political elite, they wanted a kind of like a functioning federation, really. Something you could see, let's say, let's say, for instance, Switzerland. I mean, to, to the federal government that has some important powers, talking about foreign policy, defense, I mean, uh, of course, finances, single currency. And the ideas of the Slovak politi politicians, various, I mean, Slovak politicians, again, there were some people who favored still the federation, the concept of federation. But other, they just wanted something, they call it the common state, but it's something when there is uh, a sover sovereignty of the Slovak government, you know, and I think that it's, it, it may be even quite hard to translate it, not only because perhaps my lack of the knowledge of the English language, but because, because the ideas may sound crazy or un incomprehensible, I mean, to English listeners, because how can you have a one state and two sovereign governments? It's just impossible. An additional problem was the different approach to economic reforms. Klaus wanted to reform the state quickly and knew that Slovakia would slow down this process. Then Václav Klaus, on ball. Václav Klaus was as if possessed by the thought of rapid economic transformation. It was said of him, of course I don't know if this was true, that he wanted to get the Nobel Peace Prize for the fastest political transformation of the country. But, to reiterate, this was what people said. Well, when the elections ended up with Václav Klaus and his right-wing party winning decisively in the Czech Republic and Vladimir Mečiar winning in Slovakia and his party, which nobody saw for what it actually was, being based on some kind of populism, then Klaus realized that Czechoslovakia could not be sustained. The situation accelerated in the summer of 1992. In July, the parliament did not re-elect Havel as president, even though he was the only candidate. Instead, on July 17th, the Slovak National Council adopted the Declaration of Independence of the Slovak Nation. And on July 20th, Václav Havel, the president of Slovakia, terminates his mandate. These were the circumstances under which, in the summer of 1992, the talks began. To tell this story, we took to Brno in Moravia. It was there, not far from the birthplace of Tomasz Masaryk, the founder of Czechoslovakia, that negotiations about the future of the state were to take place. The politicians talked here, in the Villa Tugendhat, a villa which today has become a symbol of the dissolution. In terms of the public awareness, it was not um, an uh, official meeting here. That's also the reason why uh, these famous photographs by Jeff Gratofil uh, were really taken from the distance uh, behind the fence. Uh, because uh, it wasn't, wasn't presented to the public before. And uh, then after all these, these couple of days of discussions, uh, during the press release, uh, they finally stated that that was the topic we've met here, it's official now. The most important part of the talks took place in the garden. Here on August 26, 1992, the decision to split Czechoslovakia was reached a decision that was made in a personal conversation between Prime Minister Klaus and Mečer. The official divorce was to take place with the end of 1992. And indeed, on January 1st, 1993, Czechoslovakia was dissolved. Czech journalist Michal Musil tells us about that day. Uh, January 1st, 1993. And that was also the, the end of the federal TV channel. So. But well, one could think that there would be a kind of like celebration. I mean, a new, okay, so Czechoslovakia is over, but now we have our independent Czech state or whatever. There was something completely different. <laughs> it's like uh, the, the, the midnight, and then a couple of seconds blackout. And then there was not the prime minister of the country, at the time, the president uh, was not elected yet. Not the prime minister, not, not the head of the, of the, of the parliament, of the uh, lower house of the parliament. 
but there was a, a lady who was famous for presenting TV programs and it for, for a moment it looked like she actually took over the country <laughs> that there was a coup <laughs> organized by her <laughs> and she said I mean it sounded almost like uh, the King's speech from 1939 on this grave hour. I know that many of you are in tears. It's something like she said. Really. <laughs> I can recall that and again say for, for people of my generation it was funny because we didn't feel it. I pamiętaj, pamiętam też takiej atmosfery, że mm, Słowacy raczej świętowały tego 1 stycznia. I remember that atmosphere. Slovaks mostly celebrated on that January the 1st, 1993. There was no celebration on the Czech side. I don't think there was as much joy, rather a bit of sadness, and also a bit of regret about not being able to keep up the union. Many Slovaks welcomed independence, but many others were fearful for the future. Today's president of the Bratislava Policy Institute, Professor Michal Waszeczka, was one of those people. I was in the group that was also not very enthusiastic about the idea of an independent Slovakia, but not because of these sentiments about Czechoslovakia being such a strong entity, but rather of whom this independence came with. And this is important, because if independence comes with very autocratic and anti-democratic tendencies, then the question is, in the 21st century, whether this independence simply makes sense, and what type of liberation it is if we start living in an autocratic state. And this is exactly what happened in Slovakia, that this independence unfortunately did not come with the social elite, the political elite of the country, but with people who, so to speak, for example, did not contribute anything meaningful to the Slovak question. There have been quite a few socialists, social democrats, liberals, conservatives, Christian democrats in Slovak history. You can talk about various waves, and they all publish something about how they see Slovakia in the 21st century. Mečiar and others were just a group of people who simply wanted to privatize Slovakia to their advantage. And unfortunately, that's how it ended in the 1990s. The peaceful nature of the split was a worldwide phenomenon, and the maturity of the process, called the Velvet Divorce, was admired all over the world. It was possible for two reasons. Firstly, there were no minority problems. And secondly, there were no border disputes. Czechoslovakia, therefore, did not repeat what happened in Yugoslavia. The border, uh... As far as Czechoslovakia is concerned, there was no such threat, because there were no minorities such as Serbs in Croatia or in Bosnia. There was no problem with borders like there was in Yugoslavia with the so-called Avnoisk borders established by the Anti-Fascist Council for the National Liberation of Yugoslavia. The borders were drawn up according to the needs and decisions made by Josip Tito, who had the idea that a strong Yugoslavia would be created by a weak Serbia. His idea was correct, by the way, that these republics, as much as was possible, were supposed to be in a state of balance. None of them was to be much greater than the others. So these borders did not at all reflect the ethnic state in Yugoslavia, and that is why there was this terrible civil war in the 1990s. However, this does not mean that the relationship between Czechs and Slovaks was immediately perfect. I can recall my trip, and it was a journalistic trip, uh, to Bratislava, uh, it was fall 1992. The, the atmosphere, I mean, in restaurants, when you were uh, Czech, the, the atmosphere was somehow tense. You know, when I wanted to order food, me and my, my uh, fellow reporter wanted to order food, and you know, and it was Bratislava, the most, perhaps the most uh, fe pro federal city in Slovakia, plus Košice, perhaps. And then, some years uh, later, I traveled to Bratislava again. It was, it was the, my first trip to Bratislava after the, the, the dissolution of the Federation. I think it was 1994. And the situation was already different. 
but it was also more complicated because at that time the prime minister was Vladimir Mechiar and what was really on the agenda I mean f for many people we met uh, back then was Mechiar and Mechiarism and this this the, the, the fear of authoritarianism coming to Slovakia which was quite legitimate from my point of view but Another trip was 2004, at the time I was still young, <laughs> so 32, and then that was a completely different atmosphere. I mean, Bratislava was totally different city, the atmosphere was great, and then was, that was really the moment when I felt, perhaps for the first time in my life, that we were, we were really brothers. You know, the moment when we're actually uh, coming down to a bar, started drinking, then we see some guys, one of us knew or had known before. And that, that, was, that was really something. And all the, the atmosphere, the tense atmosphere, I could recall from uh, 1992, it was gone. It was gone. And all of a sudden, really like brothers. And it's, it's, it's still like that. I mean... Um, Food, uh, sport matches, particularly ice hockey matches. Always the majority of Czech people support the Slovak team and in reverse. Tak, no chyba y, ciężko dzisiaj znaleźć y, w Europie dwa narody. It's hard to find two nations in Europe today that are so friendly towards each other. On top of that, two nations that previously formed a common state. For the most part, especially if we look at the history and the present day in Central and Eastern Europe, we see that nations that previously formed common states are, well, if not hostile, then at least distrustful towards each other, especially if we look at the region of the former Yugoslavia or the former Soviet Union. If you ask Czechs how they see Slovaks, most speak very positively about them, and the same is true the other way round. There is no other nation that looks at the other side so positively as Slovaks and Czechs. The Czechs look very positively on the Slovaks. It's like a marriage that divorced, and years later, everyone remembers it very well. They only remember the positive things. The negative ones are simply and practically non-existent. To this day, the Czech and Slovak languages intermingle in both countries countries, says Tomasz Strażaj, director of the Research Center of the Slovak Foreign Policy Association. Indeed, Czech is also spoken in government offices here in Slovakia, and the same is true with Slovak in the Czech Republic. My son, for example, was born in the Czech Republic, but he has Slovak citizenship without any additional actions on our part. We went abroad because we liked the hospital, but there was no administrative barrier once we were there and we were treated just like everyone else in the hospital. And that's what Czechs also encounter here. Slovak students can study in their own language at Czech universities. As a result, Slovaks joke that their best university is actually abroad, says Vít Dostal, executive director of the Czech think tank AMO. A large number of Slovaks study in the Czech Republic and then often stay and develop careers here in the Czech Republic. This is for sure a brain drain, which is not good for Slovakia. It is true that this brain drain, this flight of brains from Slovakia is a very serious problem. And it is a bigger problem than in Poland, because, of course, every Pole can say that we're familiar with this, and we know many young Poles who go to Britain or to Germany to study. In Slovakia, the problem is much bigger, because in the Czech Republic, Slovaks can study in their own language. They write their papers in Slovak and practically feel at home there. The problem is that the number of people who have already left is as much as all the students that have studied in Slovakia for 35 years. Today, the atmosphere in Slovakia is not very favorable because everyone who wants to get a good education leaves the country. People who don't leave are asked by those who are left, what are you still doing there? What are you even looking for in this country? It's obvious that you won't get a good education there. Of course, it's not so black and white, but the atmosphere is important. The perception of reality is more important than reality itself. This, however, does not work the other way around. There are not many Czechs who emigrate to Slovakia. 
This asymmetry, for example, manifests itself in labor migrations. Of course, it's more of a one-way migration from Slovakia to the Czech Republic, which is even greater than in the last two decades of Czechoslovakia. There are some Czechs in Slovakia, but most Czechs left already in the 1992-1993 period, at the time of the dissolution of Czechoslovakia. And this was also linked to these relations, because it's true that in 1991-1992, these relations were not the best. To be precise, it was said that Czech, for some nationalists in Slovakia, was a language they did not even want to hear. That's all behind us now. It doesn't exist at all. But for a lot of Czechs, this was something that drove them out of the country. Today, of course, there are Czechs in Slovakia, businessmen, a few academics. But to tell you the truth, it's the same as if I were looking for German academics in Poland. Of course, there are some, but it's more like one in a hundred. A certain inequality between Czechs and Slovaks is therefore still noticeable. In my opinion, Slovaks know Czech culture better than Czechs know Slovak culture. The Czech Republic is a bigger country, and that is why often some films, but also language knowledge, is better in Slovakia. The knowledge of the Czech language than the knowledge of Slovak in the Czech Republic, in my opinion. And it starts at a very young age. I can say that my children find it difficult to understand Slovak, and I think that this is not the case in Slovakia with Czech, because even cartoons are very often watched by Slovak children in Czech. But this is not the case in the Czech Republic. When cartoons from Slovakia are aired in the Czech Republic, they are dubbed into Czech. And even when some films appeared, they were also dubbed. Which, in my opinion, is a disaster, and it's a pity that this is still taking place, and there are not enough joint programs. I remember that, for example, when there are some sports channels, they are Czechoslovakian, and there are Czech and Slovak commentators, and together they comment football. But this is rare. Today, many compare Czechs and Slovaks to siblings, with the Czechs acting as the older brother. Like, for example, in the issue of the upcoming Slovak elections. In the Czech Republic, it seems to me that there is a bit of a panic about what will happen in Slovakia after the elections. That if Fica wins, there will be a very strong turn in the direction of authoritarianism and populism. That you don't know what will come out of it. I even heard rumors or ideas that the Czech Republic should somehow rescue Slovakia, because we are the older brother, so we must do something about it. I think we are looking at Slovakia, that it's going in a bad direction, and of course, information about what is going wrong is leaking out to the media to reinforce this sense that we need to rescue them. Sometimes we don't look at these relations as between two equal countries. Sometimes we want to be in that position of the older, more experienced one, who will show the Slovaks the proper course. The unique relationship between the two countries is also still visible in sports, and it's sometimes the case that Czechs cheer for Slovaks and Slovaks cheer on Czechs. I can't speak for everyone, but if a Czech team is no longer in the game and a Slovak team still is, then I always root for the Slovaks. I even remember once, I think it was the first time Slovakia won the World Hockey Championship, when people gathered in the restaurant and garden bars to watch Slovakia's matches on the big screen. They even sang the Slovak national anthem after that match. It's an interesting fact that Andrei Babiš, one of the most popular and also one of the most controversial Czech politicians, is actually a Slovak. You could hear people saying it, it shouldn't be allowed or Babiš shouldn't be the president of the Czech Republic because he comes from Slovakia. That's, that's absurd. And it was, I mean, it was mean from them. But then you can hear, you can hear a lot of jokes. I mean, and I... I cracked the jokes too a couple of weeks ago when I met a guy, a friend of mine from Slovakia in Ostrava <laughs> and I told him, look, and you know, Chaputova, I mean, the, the president of Slovakia, she decided that she would not run for re-election. So how about Babish? Don't, don't, don't you want him back? <laughs> <laughs> and, the, uh, the, and, and the answer was, uh, no, not really, thanks, thanks a lot, but we have our own problems. Of course, that guy is liberal. Political relations between the Czech Republic and Slovakia are described as special. Traditionally, the first foreign visit of the new leaders is to their neighbor's capital, 
In the case of the Czech president, it's Bratislava, and in the case of the Slovak president, it's Prague. Ja bym powiedział, że te pierwsze wizyty do I would say that these first visits from Prague to Bratislava and from Bratislava to Prague, that this is a certain tradition and perhaps also a courtesy. And it shows the importance of these relations primarily on this social level. If we were talking about strategic partners or partners who we should undertake certain common strategic goals with, then Czech politicians should rather go to Berlin or to Warsaw. So these visits are more like a tradition although traditions are important as well. A new phase in the Czech-Slovak relations was opened by the country's accession to the European Union. It was a very fashionable slogan at the time that we had to split up so that we could come together in the European Union. And there was some evidence to this that was pointed out, that Slovakia would have its own commissioner and the Czech Republic its own separate commissioner, that instead of having one, we would have two. We would also have more MEPs in the European Parliament and so on and so forth, that it all worked out in our favour. During the 1990-1992 talks on the so-called Slovak problem, there were demands from the Slovak side that, on the one hand, Slovakia gained a certain international agency, but on the other hand, the same circles wanting, as it were, to mix oil and water, postulated the preservation of one statehood with the Czech Republic. And it seems that the current situation, with both countries being part of the European Union and the Schengen area, as well as allies in NATO, is in a way a fulfillment of those dreams, the shape of which they were not able to imagine at the time. Slovakia has been part of the Eurozone since 2009, and Slovak experts themselves admit that they would like to see the single currency in the Czech Republic as well. These bilateral relations are also good, they are also very intensive. And here I have just one question, which is very important for us here in Slovakia. When will the Czech Republic become a member of the Eurozone? It would be very beneficial and very convenient for us to have the Czechs and, by the way, the Poles and perhaps the Hungarians in the Eurozone, to have even more intensive communication and cooperation. However, it doesn't look like Czechs will be supporting their country's entry into the Eurozone anytime soon. Currently, some 70 up to even 80 percent of Czechs are persistently, year after year, against it, according to the most reliable surveys. It doesn't seem that this request could be fulfilled in the foreseeable future. Interestingly, up until 2004, sociological surveys showed that the majority of Slovaks stated they would have voted to keep Czechoslovakia. This only changed after joining the European Union, but Czechoslovakia is still fondly remembered. Currently, even people who were against Czechoslovakia 30 years ago, I mean people who can be described as Slovak nationalists, today look at that period very positively, saying more or less, well, after all, the Czechs were very honest and they just left Slovakia alone. Slovakia could leave. That's the approach. And all the others who are on the side of the Federation, they only remember the good parts. And in a way, that's the problem. The question of why these countries were divided in the first place is still in the air. However, no one is seriously thinking of returning to a shared Czechoslovak state. Oh, well, I haven't seen anyone with a make Czechoslovakia great again cap. And this is an interesting question. Why aren't we sentimental about this larger state? It's worth thinking about. Maybe the Czechs feel that they haven't lost that much with Slovakia. Maybe there is this continuity there, because what used to be Czechoslovakia, we feel that today is still the Czech Republic. Perhaps the Czechs are not a nation that needs this type of magnitude. We might differ a little in this case from some of our neighbors, from Poland or Hungary. Well, it seems to me that today we can say with a great deal of conviction that there is no going back to Czechoslovakia. Because, in fact, today a common state, if it were recreated, would not respond to any significant Czech and Slovak challenges, neither the economic, political or security-related ones. 
It seems that the two countries want to respond to them separately, which does not mean, of course, that they do not have a common position on certain issues. They are together, of course, in the European Union, in NATO, in the Visegrad group, in various other regional formats. And in fact, you can see that this cooperation is very close and will probably continue to be close, both because of geography and because of the quite similar structural conditions. These countries have a lot in common, and the fact that they actually function today in the same military alliance, in a single market and in a single customs area, proves that many of those barriers that emerged in 1993 do not exist today.